head in the game. Okay. All right, we're live. We are. We're live. Here we go. You ready to talk about this movie? Oh, yeah. Our 45th show, babe. 45, 45. The end of sci-fi. This, this is a residual movie over from Romantic Fridays. Yes, this is a, a Romantic Friday, Saturday film. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> let's see what people have to say about that. We shall see. It'll be quite interesting. Yep. Uh... <laughs> Are you ready to talk I, about this? I am totally ready. <laughs> Greetings, imagination connoisseurs and members of this, the post-geek singularity community. I am your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude and your sommelier of cinema, and I am here with my compatriot. Who might you be? I am Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell. I am the ace, the arbiter of cinematic excellence and the enchantress of entertainment. The enchantress of entertainment and on that note, I would like to publicly apologize to you for last the last episode we did last night on Never Let Me Go. I must have been suffering from the Mandala effect or something, but I was insistent. <laughs> I was insistent I that was Sally funny. Hawkins, Miss Lucy from Never Let Me Go, never used the word organ donation, didn't use the word organ. I stand corrected. Many people corrected me. But I would be remiss if I did not uh, admit to you in public on our show that I was mistaken. It's okay. So I profusely apologize. <laughs> you don't have to do I that. just wanted everybody to know. I mean, I did come off like a dick. You were insistent. I was insistent. I, 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 I have called you a dick. I was a dick. You were you were insistent. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. But I knew I was right. That's why I was like whatever. Well, now that the uh, now that the business is out of the way, let's drink. <laughs> let's drink. And uh, as all of you know on this show, we share a bottle of wine if you're new to the show and we watch a movie. And tonight's bottle of wine is another Pinot Noir from the Central Coast, Firefly Ridge. Firefly Ridge. Yes, Firefly and Ridge. We were gonna drink uh, Claude and Candida's white tonight. We were. But, uh, but we didn't. We didn't pregame. You wanted something a little bit more liquored yeah, up, so you could I, be a little I, bit more I liquored need up. A little more, you know, a little more alcohol tonight. to talk about this film. I, I, I think you might. I, I definitely. We didn't. We didn't. We're not. We haven't been pregaming, so. Uh, no, we haven't. Have been doing shots. Well, let's drink. To uh um, <clears throat> hang on uh, uh the wait I just want to get on my uh Morton Tidham's movie Passengers from 2016. from 2016. John Spates wrote this movie. John Spates, uh, who is credited on Dune as one of the three screenwriters, John Spates wrote this script in 2007. It was a blacklist script. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong camera. It was a blacklist script. <laughs> And uh, it it was considered one of the great unproduced scripts in Hollywood. It didn't come out until 2016. Uh, Keanu Reeves was going to be in this movie at one point and, oh. and wasn't. It took oh. a long time to develop. And I have to say, I was a huge fan of the script. But I don't think the final film... Well, you'll get to that. ...is a great representation of the script. Yeah, but I just want to say... But I still... Oh, yeah, it's different than the script. I still like this movie against... Against a lot of people's better judgment. Well, we'll get to that point. So let's drink to J Law and Chris Pratt. Chris, here's to Chris Pratt. And here's to J Law, <laughs> and uh, here's to interstellar space, and how the universe is indifferent to your suffering. To 2016's Passengers. 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 Mm-hmm. I didn't even bother to sniff this. I just drank it. Me too. It's pretty delightful, though. Ooh, that's nice. Mm. Mm. Firefly Ridge. Well, Elizabeth, what is this movie about? And don't say what I think you're going to say. We're not going to use that word. We're not. We're not. What is this movie about? This this is a romance. It is? <laughs> is it a bad romance? Is this something that Lady, Lady Gaga might have sung about? This is a romance. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so... It starts off with you see a a spaceship that looks like a beautiful chandelier floating through space. It is. It's a beautiful chandelier that is floating through space, and um, it is autopiloted. And there are five thousand passengers that are in hibernation, and they are on their way to and and two hundred and like ninety eight crew members as well. Yes. 
And they are on their way to colonize Homestead 2. Yes. Because someone was really thinking when they named that planet. <laughs> I guess that's the name of the colony. Maybe the planet is named something else. Well, but I we, hope so. And their, their journey is over 100 years. They've, they've, 120 years it takes to get there. 120 years, and they've already been going for 30 years. They've been going for 30 years. The ship is 30 years into its journey. Yes, and then you see that it's going through um, uh, some asteroids, some some meteors, and the ship... And has, everyone knows the odds of successfully... Navigating an asteroid field are 3,720 to 1. Right. I'm uh, never going to tell you the odds. <laughs> I get your reference. Okay. Um, so they uh, a large a large meteor. It's pretty cool, though. The ship has a, a, a deflector. A, a it big, has a deflector. A big shield. It's got forward shields. Very powerful shields. In case any micrometeorites, but this yeah. is a large asteroid field, and even for this ship's incredible, uh, it's still a little much. Yes, this big one is a little too much for this uh, ship, and it it hits the ship, and the it has a system of, uh, like the the power goes out for a few seconds, and um, and then one of the pods. One of the one of the the hibernation pods. One of the hibernation the, pods. The opens, cryo sleep pods. Opens and it's Chris Pratt. And wakes up Chris Pratt, the sleeping prince. <laughs> and I have to say, he's peak Chris Prattness. He's slimmed down. He looks fantastic. Yeah. He's dr he's dreamy Chris Pratt. He's dreamy. Chris pr Chris Pratt's is. He's not Guardians of the Galaxy too. Chris Pratt, who had too many sandwiches. He is dreamy. <laughs> dreamy. Then, that's okay. He's dreamy, Chris he's Star Pratt. Star Lord. Come on, man. He's Star Lord. He's he's the um he's the main uh goal of my little short films. Yes. Okay, so uh he wakes up and he is escorted to his room, and once he shakes off the hibernation, he goes out and he's supposed to meet up with his group of people, which are the engineers and the mechanics. And he goes into that meeting and there's nobody there. Nobody there. And the There's um, nobody anywhere. No. But he doesn't realize this until the hologram is talking and he's like, um, where's everyone else? And she totally ignores him, and then that's when he realizes, uh, oh shit. He goes into the observatory. He goes into the observatory. Where there's a holographic representation of the galaxy, the Milky Way. You can ask it wherever you want, want and it'll show you. Yes, so he goes in there and he asks, uh, show me Homestead 2. So it shows him Homestead 2, and then he's like, uh, show me where we are now. And it does, and then he asks... Um, how how far are we, basically? You've got and 90 years left, buddy. 90 years. 90 years. They are 90 years away from... So he better get back in his hibernation chamber or he's going to grow old and die on the ship all by yeah, himself. So it, so it strikes him like, oh my God, I woke up too soon. Um, This fucking sucks. <laughs> so he... Um, he's frantic at this point and he's running around and he's he tries to get back into his pod and it won't close and he so then he is wandering around the ship and he sees a bar he meets he michael sees, sheen he sees a bartender and he's like oh my god another another person it's so good to see another person and then he goes in there and he realizes it's an android apparently michael sheen has gone from his job as a club empresario in tron legacy to now the Aurora. Yeah, and he's a really great and funny bartender. Is it the Aurora? What's the name of the ship? The Aurora? I don't uh, remember. Homestead? No, no, the actual ship's name. I don't know. Aurora is the name of... Uh, Avalon. The ship's Avalon. Aurora is the girl. <laughs> nice Roxy Music reference. <sighs> or Arthurian reference, if you, if you will. Yes. So... Oh. I needed more wine. Okay, me too. Okay, so um, because he's a mechanic, he um, he tries to figure out what to do. Tries to figure out what to do. 
and he goes and he tries to open up the uh, the chamber where the the crew is so he can get some help um and it's impossible to get in there he also tries to send a message to earth and cost him six thousand dollars cost him six thousand dollars it'll take um, 56 years to get an answer that's right 56 years to get an answer um and he does a bunch of stuff where he's just trying to figure this all out he's screwed he's pretty screwed and so he spends months just a year over a year right, and he grows a big bushy beard and he just becomes this grizzly guy well i mean can you imagine like anaria your favorite swedish science fiction film i mean this literally is you are facing the cosmic void i i i I do like the existential implications of this. I mean, yeah. you, there is no one, there is nothing. There's and, no one. And there's 5,000 people that he can wander amongst and look at them in stasis yeah. and Could see them. Yeah, you imagine? And he will never, he will, he was facing the possibility of growing old and dying. Yeah. And uh, even people in prison have more contact with humanity than... Yes, absolutely. He, he's on a be, cosmic prison. It would be like being uh, in the isolation... Um, for the rest of yeah, life. Uh, yes. So he then discovers a room where you can put on a spacesuit and go out. You know, you're tethered to the ship, but you get to go out into outer space. So he tries that. He does that, and he's just overwhelmed. And when he comes back in and takes off the suit, he he thinks that's it. I'm just going to end it because I I can't exist like this by myself. So he goes back to try to do it, and he just can't get bring himself to push the button. And as he's running back out of there, um, traumatized, he um, slips on a bottle that he had thrown earlier. And when he gets up, he sees Aurora in her pod. And so he... Um, sees her name and then he goes and he researches who she is and he gets her interviews for uh getting onto the ship and watches them for a long time he does he watches them for a long time and he gets to know her and she's written books she's a writer so he reads her books and so um he really feels a connection to her because he's gotten to know her Boom, chicka, boom, boom. she's it's hot she's j-law <laughs> She looks smoking good in that, that, uh, she's, by the way, she's peak J-Law now, too. No baby fat on her. Yeah, yeah. So they're prime specimens of humanity, prime. these two. They are. They're in their prime. Oh. Um, and it's kind of like getting to know someone, um, via a dating app. Well, that's true. And I think there's definitely a part of that. You know, there's a part of, and, and I think there is, there is, the original screenplay was much, I think, better in terms of dealing with this kind of thing. Yeah. Dealing with the existential crises and dealing with the fact that we now live in worlds where we we can have relationships with people we've never even met. Yes. You can follow them on social media. You can become yes, obsessed absolutely. with them. You can develop feelings for them. And we see that. You we can. see psychotic behavior. Absolutely. And that not happens. that I would know anything about that kind of no, thing. No, of course but, not. Uh, but there, there, is, there is definitely that element in there, which I liked. I don't think yeah. they explored it enough, but still, it's just enough. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it could have been a little more. Um, but they have to, it's, a, it's a Hollywood movie, so it has to move along. Yes. So, um, he spends months getting to know her, and he has these conversations with the bartender about it, and, you know, one day he thinks... Look, he's got... He's got a, he's, this is a moral... It is. He, he, the decision is, he's, is he going to wake her up? Is he going to wake He's, her up? He, and if he wakes her up, there's no going back. He wakes her up forever. So Right, and he knows, like, okay, if I do this, this is very wrong. I should not wake her up because that means her life will be spent on this ship. And, um, first of all, I don't have a permission to do that, and um, so he's back and forth constantly for for months. I mean, it's I, I think this is the crux of why this movie had a lot of backlash. Absolutely, which is interesting because when I read the script, I didn't feel this way. Yeah, because it's for him, it's death. It's either this or yes. die. Yeah, and and people are comparing this to like, oh, well, he just kidnapped her and murdered her basically and um, stalked her. 
Uh, I think this is a little different than some stalker. Well, isn't it who stalks a girl and kidnaps yeah. her and murders her? I, I think that that's one of the things that when this movie came out, there was a, there was I would say, maybe a millennial backlash, yes. and there's a lot of critics as well. Who looked at it that way? Mm -hmm. the, this is a creepy stalker. Yeah, one person says it, and then they all latched on. But I mean, they're not taking into consideration the the, the cosmic void. When you look into the abyss, the abyss yeah. looks into you, and it is the cosmic void that awaits him. Mm -hmm. it, it is it is a loneliness and a death that we can't even imagine. Yes, and, and that's right. what he's facing. And he could have chosen to kill himself. And he couldn't do it. I mean, he, he couldn't, just couldn't do, it. do it. But now, and now, especially that he's in love with her. Right. Um, and by the way, I'm not trying to justify. No, 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 no. But I'm trying to explain that this is not. A, a lot of people think it's cut and dried. I don't think it's, it's cut, cut and dried. dried. I think that anyone who, any human being that's in this situation, in his situation, has the ability to turn off or open up one of these hibernation capsules. I mean. Is is thinking it's it's my life. This is my life too. My life is over. Yeah. And and how much am I willing to compromise? And which is a decision we see many protagonists make in many different stories. Absolutely. They make life changing decisions for other people. They do. They do. They absolutely do. When you get into a car drunk, you are making decisions for other people. That's an interesting. Where'd you come up with that? I don't know. I'm just thinking of situations where we haven't been making... drunk in a car and. No, I can't I'm just, remember the last I'm thinking time. Of situations where you're making decisions for other people, right? Or right. when you go out and you're not wearing your mask, you are making a decision for everyone else around well, you. Well, and this is this decision is final. This is I a mean, final I mean, decision. it's a final. Ba basically, he's he's dooming. If he wakes her up, he's dooming her. He is. To he's dooming her. A life that she had no choice in. Absolutely. So. Yeah, that'd be rough. Try, imagine if you were in that situation. Well, we're getting we're getting we're we, we're getting into what we should talk about after we yeah, finish. Yeah, okay. I'm just, so what does he do? Okay, so uh, finally he decides he's going to do it. Although he keeps trying to talk himself out of it. So he goes and well, he first of all he shaves off his grizzly beard. Yeah, I mean, long story short here. Okay, why I mean, are we rushing? No, I, it's, we don't have to rush, but it's like. Okay, so he goes and he opens up her pod. He opens up her pod. And uh, and he runs away, of course, before she wakes up. And then uh, as she's wandering around in the ship, uh, he appears. <laughs> so he, uh, she's like, well, where is everyone? Where's the, I don't can't find anyone. Where's the crew? And, and he's like, oh, it's just me. And she's like, what do you mean? Um, and then he explains that the their pods opened up accidentally and they are 90 years or 89 years at this point. 89 years. So he spent a year alone. Um, they were 89 years away from Homestead 2. And she freaks out. And he also tells Michael Sheehan to keep it a secret. Right. He tells, don't don't he ever don't, tell her... Yeah. That I've been obsessing about her for months and I've been telling you all this stuff. And that I opened up her pod. Don't tell her. Yeah, that it's a secret. Okay, so um, she freaks out. She freaks out. And um, and she tries to figure out a way to fix it. Why can't Just we like, get why can't we get into the pods? He's what, already been he's been and, the whole road that he traveled for a year. Yeah, and she gets frustrated with him because he's like, No, can't do it. I tried but, all this. And that would frustrate me too. I would have been like, "Come on, man, let's do it." Well, but every person, every person has to go through their own thing here. She does. She has to go through that. So, um, so she spends weeks trying to figure out a solution. And to be fair, he holds back. He does. He hangs back. He doesn't pressure her. He no. doesn't. He's not too overbearing or anything like that. Yeah. He's a gentleman. Yeah. Because he knows that. He just has to wait it out because where is she going to go? Right. Yeah. That's why I I don't consider him a... Uh, I don't consider this space rape. Oh, you weren't supposed to say that. Um, I mean, but it, I mean, look, but consent is clearly a big issue. But it they, is. But they get to know each other they and, and they... It, it's, um, it's a nice... I mean, it's... But if, he, if it were in the real world where he wasn't in a spaceship and he wasn't doomed to being alone for 90 years, he wouldn't have done that. Well... 
Right, that's he true. He would have kidnapped no, someone he's not that kind of guy. or raped a, he, a girl. He's not that kind of guy. And I, and I think that, that, you know, there's a lot of intellectual uh, understanding that this movie is requiring the audience to make on behalf right. of his plight. There's a lot of people that will never forgive. Right. Like Vito Corleone. And then I do not forgive. Right. If he should get struck by lightning. Yeah. Well, so then what happens? So, so they fall in love. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yes, they fall in love, and they spend many, many months being in love, and then one night, it's her birthday, and, uh... Um, they're going out on a proper date, they dress to the to nines. the French restaurant, um, they're all dressed up, and he, um... Well, then what happens? Oh, then they go to the bar. Well, they go to the bar first. They oh. go to the French restaurant. Oh, they yeah, go, okay, whatever. It's a bunch of different stuff happening. It, it all, he's going to propose. He's, he the made a ring. He, he made, made a ring. ring. He's going to propose to he's her. He's going to propose to her, and he they're at the bar, and he steps away for a minute. Oh, and they joke around and say, oh, we don't have any secrets from each other. Yeah, and, and he says, we don't have any secrets. And Michael Sheehan's like, oh, I, okay, well, if you have no secrets from one another. Yeah. So he leaves. Because he's an android. He doesn't know. He doesn't oh, know the there subtlety. are no secrets. He's a pretty smart android, but not smart enough. Uh, yeah, well. Um, and so he, he tells her. He tells her. He tells her that. Um, he's, for months. For months, he struggled with the thought of opening her pod. And and then, he, good thing it all worked out and that they're so in love. And she's like, what? He opened my pod. I have to say, I have to say, her reaction is a great bit of acting. On her part. I mean, the destruction of her soul. I really... A lot of people said she wasn't that good in this movie. I know, I read that. I I think that the the, the reaction that she has is a great bit of acting on her I, part. I don't think... I think people uh, have a problem with... I think when she initially comes out of the pod, I don't think her reaction was strong enough. But I think that has more to do with direction than with her acting. I mean, she's a really great actress. Um, and so, um, but, but yes, when she reacts to learning that he had opened up her pod, Man, that it's... was quite a reaction. Loved it. Yeah. So at this point now she's pissed. She's pissed. She's pissed. She doesn't want anything to do with him. Um, and she avoids him at every turn for months. For months. And, for and months. but then we see that whatever caused his pod to open whatever accident that we know that it was caused by the meteor strike that the ship we've seen it's been suffering failure and the failures are getting yes. worse and worse they're getting worse and worse the and ship and there's 5,000 people passengers at stake and the ship is suffering from more and more catastrophic yes failures it's good at repairing itself but the shit's going yeah. down on the ship the shit's going down it's starting to break down okay so uh eventually uh, there's a glitch and another pod is opened and it's a ca the captain of the deck of a deck. Yeah, he's, he's not the he, captain captain, but he's a captain. Yeah, he's not the captain of the ship, but he's 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 a man that he's, he's a like a mechanic captain. a deck and it's Larry Fishburne. It's Morpheus. It is. Morpheus shows up but but he's a little off. He's got hibernation sickness. Yeah, he's very and in sick. the in the original script, this is interesting, his character was over six hundred years old. Because he made he many journeys, he'd been, oh he'd been going goodness. back and forth. And this is one of the things that I, 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 I think this is my problem with Hollywood development. When when you have a script that everybody loves, then what happens is when the studio gets a hold of it, and you get movie stars and all that, the things that make it that make it special special gets they start to get bled out of it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of a lot of those more sci-fi cuz they're like, "No, we have to get to the romance. We got to have the these people and it's, we have to make it fun for the audience." Well, what that kind of thinking what it does is all that unique stuff gets bled yes. out of the film. And and Larry Fishburne's character, pardon me, Lawrence, he goes by Lawrence now. Lawrence Fishburne's character, great character by the way. But it would have yeah. been nice, like with the rest of the script, the script was a little bit more fleshed out on every... And he had a lot more character than... He's yeah. pretty generic. He's he's kind of generic. Um, but, oh, also, we forgot to mention that um, uh, Chris Pratt found the where they grow the plants and stuff. 
and uh, he planted a tree right in the middle of the huge the promenade. The promenade. Big, yeah. um, and so um, Lawrence comes out and he's like, who planted a tree on my deck? Right. And um, that's how they they discover that there's another person awake. So they go to talk to him and he has access to places that they haven't had access to up till now. He can get him right into the bridge. So, yes. And he has overrides, his ID and everything. Yep. Out. So he goes in there and discovers that there's some, he knows like there's something wrong because none of the pods should have opened up. And they're fails. They're foolproof. Yeah. So he goes in to figure out what happened. And he notices that um, the system that shows the breakdown of everything is not even working. So he knows it's pretty serious. So they go into the mechanical room. Yeah, well, all three of them, st he, he enlists the two, Chris Pratt and J-Lo, to help him. And they basically right. do a systems check. And, and, and then he says he's going to go check the pods. So he goes and checks what happened to the pods and discovers that um, the secret that... Chris had opened up. Um, what is his name in the in the movie? Uh, uh, Larry Fishburne's character. No, um, Chris Pratt's. Uh, uh, name. What is his it's, name? Uh, Jim. Jim. So he notices that Jim had opened up Aurora's pod. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, what's hap What's interesting is is now the ship emergency is sort of bringing the two of them back together. They're, 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 they're all three of their uh, survivors well, not staying. not quite yet. I mean, no, but I mean, they're, like, they're all, they're so, all the three of them. And then she asks him, she asks uh, Lawrence Fishburne, so you know what happened? He, he murdered me is what she says. Right, she's, and, and, and that's, that again, very interesting. And he's like, look, a drowning man will take somebody down with you. Yes. Like he, he like, I think... And again, he, get, he gets it. Like the, this guy is gonna be alone for ninety years. But I think without the character development, it could be mistaken that you've got two guys ganging yes. up on a girl. Yeah. And I think that's a real problem yeah, yeah, with the yeah, film. Yeah. Absolutely, is is that it, it? It and I I watching it with you again. I objected to this. I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? It looks like two dudes are justifying what was done, yeah. and it, it, they're ganging up on a woman. Yes, 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 yes. Which yes. is something that wasn't in the script, and it's something I think it comes off in the film. I, I don't think I'm making this up. I think it really it yeah. really struck me as like, he's like, well, you know, like he's not sympathetic enough to the yeah. plight of what's happening. And yeah. I think that was another problem You're with right. how audiences took this movie. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay. So... They go to figure out what is really happening to the ship. Yeah, they go to figure out what's happening with the ship, and they realize that there's been meteorite meteor damage that yeah. nobody knew about. Well, not quite yet. So, well, I mean, they lose gravity, and she's stuck in the pool. She's stuck in a big yeah. Bowl I mean, of the, water. there's, there's kind of, it's really and cool. That's a that's a, yeah. an incredible scene too. Yeah, by the way. and and then so. Um, they discover okay, Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne kind of falls apart, and they well, his 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 the cryo chamber that he was in, it was malfunctioning, and and, and it it it, 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 him it up. basically killed him. Yeah. It, it it caused catastrophic failure. So they in find him. out that he's he's gonna die any minute, and so um, he hands over his bracelet so they can get into stuff, and he tells them to fix the ship, and he dies. Well, he fixes the ship. Up to a point. No, he's telling them to go fix the oh, ship. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, and then and then he dies. And then he dies. And then he dies, and they have to find out what's going on. Yeah, and they, they have to because there are five thousand people. They on have five thousand people, and, and and they have they find out it's the drive system, it's the engine that needs to vent plasma. Right. And the door is not opening up, yeah. so they can't do the venting of the plasma. And by this time, the the two of them, J Law and Aurora and Jim. Are they? They are of singular purpose. Yes. Now they they're must, working together. They must save their each other's a, lives. This is the ma a matter of life and death. It's a matter and of life and death. Not just for themselves, but for a lot of people. And by the way, it needs to be pointed out that if Jim had not been awakened, yeah, and if he had not awakened Aurora, yep, all of them would have died. They would have. And even if he it had just been him, there's no way he could have fixed it alone. He would never have known. He wouldn't have been able to pull the lever because she did that. And no, there's no. He wouldn't have been able to do it. 
That's not a justification, but as far as That's the plot not. is concerned, it's it's you know the universe taketh away and the universe gives it giveth back. But I don't know if you believe in fate or destiny. Maybe it was meant to be that way. Maybe it was meant to be that way. So after he has to go, he has to go do a spacewalk and come around and open the door manually, and the plasma is going to go by him. He thinks he's probably going to die, and right through a and a, his tether. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty breaks. interesting. It's not like as good as Gravity, you know, or <laughs> right. something like that. But it's a pretty it's a pretty good scene. There's real peril. Yeah. You you want them to well, succeed. Well, I have some uh, some issues. Well, wait, with... we'll talk we'll talk about that. So basically, he's they save the ship together. They they do they save the ship, but his tether um, breaks and he's floating off into space. And she goes and saves him, and brings him in. And but he she, dies. He dies. She puts him in the in the uh, hospital. The hospital pod. Pod to revive him. And, to revive him, and he is revived. He's revived. And they are back together. They're back together. I mean, they they've survived, and and uh, then then he uh, discovers that the hospital pod that you can actually uh, do hibernation in it. You can do hibernation, yes. So he tells her this. So now it's like he wants to fix what he's done, and tells her that she can. He can put her back. He into can put her back in, and she can go to sleep and awaken in ninety years or eighty-eight years. Right. And, and she stops she, not to. She decides. Yeah, she chooses not to, and she spends her life with him. And she writes her book. Um, it's not the book she had intended to write, but she writes her her story of you know her life on this ship. And then the ship arrives at Homestead 2. It does. And uh, the crew is revived and Andy Garcia. Yeah, Andy is Garcia. captain of the ship. Yeah, and he comes out and it's like a forest. In, yeah, in the... they, they've built a whole there's they built a cabin, they've built a whole thing. They've had a life together. They've had a life together. And uh, that's how the movie ends. Now, both now, of us remember a different ending. And I don't know if we saw like a preview. No, it's. Or... I, I think we just thought about it. it's. I don't think so. I re vividly remember seeing this alternate ending, where they land on Homestead Two and everyone comes out of the ship and there's a bunch of children and and middle aged people and. I know. I have a distinct memory of this as well. Maybe it's on the. The disc, the Blu-ray. We, we actually saw that scene. I, I I think I've seen that scene too. But but that now, now I have to say that what's interesting about the original screenplay that I really loved. I loved John Spates' script. I became a John Spates fan after I read the script. In the script, all the five thousand colonists are lost. They're all right. ejected to save their lives. They're like ejected from the ship. So all five thousand people are lost. And That's bleak. It, it was bleak, and the script was uh, it was a lot more, I would say, adult. Yeah. It was less movie movie, yeah. and it had a lot more going on, and that's why everyone loved this... this script. And at the end of the script, the ship arrives, it lands on Homestead Two, and all the kids, the generations, like the they've sired kids that have also sired kids, and. Right. And there's like a multi generation but of the you know family. Why they didn't do that? Because they didn't want people to complain about incest. Right. But, I, I mean, come I know. on. We're dealing with. Well, again, the script was was a far more. I think that that passengers is a perfect example, and to a certain extent, uh, Arrival, which is another great science fiction movie, much better than this, I think, is a science fiction film. Yeah. Arrival had the ending changed as well. And the ending of Arrival, the original ending was, the way the movie ends now, it's this language that allows her to... Yes. That was the gift. Well, in the original script, that's not true. In the original script, all of the countries of the world have to cooperate because they're, they've are they been given part of a blueprint of the technology that will allow the oh, human race to right. go to the stars. Oh. And so yeah, to rescue them in 3,000 years... But I understand some studio executives like, no, you know, we need to make this, we need to make this more personal. And then you end right. up with her being the only person who understands the message. And you're asking like, wait, of all the people on the earth, only she's the one? Yeah. And so it, it, it it's a mistake because, again, when you have studio executives who are not 
savvy in science fiction and don't understand, they're always going to go back, well, you have to make it more personal. And that's not a bad instinct, but a lot of the time... Well, they, it, I think I feel like they took away a lot of important things in this film. Well, they did because they wanted to make... They wanted to fork, focus more on... Well, anyway, let me ask you a question. Yeah, they oversimplified it and, and made it this weird, this weird romance instead of... You know, a a, a thoughtful uh, intellectual science fiction film. Yeah, that, I mean, it needed that included romance. It but needed a little more Inara in it. it. It needed more. It needed more something, something. A little bit more of the cosmic void. So, Elizabeth, let me ask you. Not an Aria, though. What did you think of this movie? I don't hate this movie. I don't hate it either. I do have some problems with it. Well, let's hear them. Lay them on me, babe. Okay, first of all... All right, here it comes. Um, Here's to your problem. I think it's a little ridiculous that... Uh-oh. Uh, you can't put someone back into hibernation. I think that's really dumb. That doesn't make any kind of sense. Like, they have extra parts for everything in the ship except for putting someone back into hibernation. Wait, I'm not done. Secondly, there is only one hospital pod. Only one. For 5,000 people... If they had more than one, they could have both gone back into hibernation. Um, so those You're are not wrong couple. about that. And also, what I also have a problem with is this ship on autopilot does not make sense to me. I mean, wouldn't you like have like some of the crew that would take turns and they would go into hibernation and then the, and then they would take turns piloting the ship and for what whatever problems come up like you actually need a person well okay or even not even okay if you wanted to everyone in hibernation could you at least have more than one um android couldn't there be androids on there like fixing all the problems well th these are very these are very astute i had problems with these the, are astute criticisms because you have a you have an android that why doesn't this have an android crew yeah I mean, and, and there's there's androids that sweep up the ship. Yeah. You know, there's Which there's space I want those little, space those little Roombas sweepers. are everywhere, <laughs> and they the and they're pretty good. They are. So no, I agree with you. I think that this kind of and and this is where this is where the devil is in the details. Yeah. And the fact that you come away from this movie asking very interesting logistical questions, and what would have been interesting is. Is if the I had more problems with that kind of stuff than with him opening up our pod. I know, like th that's a moral question. Like that's right. something that you have to grapple with. Like, what would I have done? Well, when it comes to science fiction films, these kinds of details are what make it. it, it it's the difference between a great movie and a movie that misses the mark. And I think the fact is, if you have a uh, there should have been androids. You know, even if they're only sitting in place. And part of the catastrophic yes. failure of yep. the ship could have been the androids were or deactivated. Or at least have a, a system where, like, okay, things are failing. Now it's time to wake up the crew. Well, that's that's what doesn't make a lot of sense. If you have a sense. ship, if you have a ship traveling through the cosmic void at half light speed for a hundred and twenty years, yeah, there have to be safety protocols. The, 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 yeah, the, the idea that oh, it's going to be and and what's really funny is the very disaster that befalls this ship. They've anticipated. It's got shields. Well, what if, what if, what yeah, if we need to steer always around? Something that could go wrong. Of course, because and the, how could five thousand people agree to go onto a ship that is being autopiloted for a hundred and twenty years? Would you trust something like that? I wouldn't. No, because because the asteroid field that they ran through could not have been detected on their course. 30 years ago because one yeah. it's too small and with with uh, the galaxy is moving everything is moving how do you plot it makes no sense no it makes and no when, sense. when and 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 these are the problems that they had now if they had a crew of androids and the catastrophic failure it befell them right you know then it would make it would and make sense once it got to the point where it was critical then i think that the uh crew pods should have opened up well and that look i i I buy into the fact that 120-year hibernation capsules or whatever they are, are that you, you you can't come back. They're they're shut off. You can't keep going back and forth. Why not? Why well, not? Because they're locked in for 120 years. Yeah, that makes no sense. Well, I know. Yet, yet I mean, the the hospital one, you could do hibernation in it. Well, that yes, that's the See, thing. That makes no you, sense. You, you, the, Why yes. aren't they 
all like that because, for situations like this. Or why wouldn't people be let out every 10 years for a month yes. to exercise, Act, get the absolutely. blood pumping? I mean, there, there's a lot of asks in this movie. Like, and great also, I was thinking, like, when he proposed to her for her to get into that pod and to be in hibernation, they could have, like, done a year on and year off so that they both last until they get to uh, Homestead 2. They could have, like, okay, you spend six months, and then I'll put you in for six months, and then we'll spend a year together, and then we'll we'll do the six-month thing over, and, and then another year together until they got there so that they could actually get well, to Homestead wouldn't, wouldn't 2. Wouldn't that, I mean, in terms of how, that wasn't part of the original script, but what, what wouldn't that have been a satisfying ending if at yes. the end they were still alive? They were still alive. They were both old. And they got there. And they were alive and they got there together and they could have walked out. See, you and I should be development executives. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We would have made You a couldn't much pay me film. enough to be a <laughs> development executive. Uh, what the most useless? It, it's it's. But well, yes, anyway. all of these things. This movie, if we had been the studio executives rewriting this film, we could have made this or or giving them notes. We could have made this a much more satisfying movie because yes. that would have been the way to end the movie. Yes. When when uh, you think that she's going in. And then when they're when the crew is awakened, yeah. Well, I think I what I would have done is like have her say no, she didn't want to do it. But then at the very end, you show that they both come out of the ship, and then you wonder, and then you do like a flashback where they did this six month in, six month in, and then a year together. That would have been a great. That ending. would have been that would have been a good ending, and people would have would have liked that. Yep. But now, I mean, that said. I think this is a very sumptuous guy, Hendrix Dias, who I work with on Superman. Well, I didn't work with him, but I I shot him doing his work on Superman Returns. I think Guy Hendrix Dias is one of the most unsung. He production designed Inception. He was nominated for an Academy Award for this movie. This movie is an incredibly beautiful. It is beautiful science fiction film. It yeah. is, it is beautifully shot. It's beautifully scored by Thomas Newman. I think that a lot of this uh, movie is uh, really sumptuous, mm -hmm. and it has a lot going for it. It's 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 fun to watch. I love the scene in the swimming pool when the gravity fails and she's drowning yeah. as she's you know she can't move. There's a lot of really great stuff in yeah. this movie, but I think it really is a case where the studio, when you hire Chris Pratt, obviously had reached a zenith with. Jurassic World and Ga Guardians of the Galaxy. He was a big star. J Law was, was a huge star. Well, no, he's still yes. But you have two stars, and this movie was tailored mistakenly. By the way, it was it, because it was made for it was over a hundred million dollar movie. They spared no expense, and they had to make it palatable for and which is always a had mistake. To? Why? They, they, because they there is up. this. There is this. There <clears throat> is this thought. That the you have to make it for the mass audience, but even even the biggest dunderhead in the audience will respond if your story is great. Yes. Even uh, this I, nobody. I hate, I hate when they they make changes that that just seem dumb. That any any person could figure out was like, wow, why is it like that? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, I just I hate when they do shit like that. Well, I mean, it it it, it shows that you know. I've always believed that authorship is the most important part of a film. And obviously, when you're spending $120 million, the people that greenlight these movies, you know, their jobs are on the line and, and they have to get in their two cents because they have to justify their position somehow. If a script is great, and this was a spec script, it was written by John Spates on spec, which means speculation. He wrote it. You love the script enough to buy it. Then what happens? We've seen it a lot on the movies we've done. The Long Kiss Goodnight. You know, that movie was better than the uh, the original script was better. The studio comes in and they try and tailor these movies, second-guessing their material. Yeah. They never, with maybe the exception of something like A Fatal Attraction, they never they never help the movie. And and this film made three hundred million dollars worldwide. It made a hundred million here. They it, it, it underperformed. It, it didn't. It wasn't a disaster. Yeah, because before it came out, it already had this label on it that it was space rape. Well, I think this movie you know has what? a lot I more. Had my, one of my clients, she was an assistant editor on this, 
and I, I really feel like we, she gave us tickets and we saw it we saw it early and and we saw the the ending differently than maybe what was I think released. it was the Mandela effect because I read the original script or maybe no, I told you I, about because it. we both have this memory of I know. that ending so I, know. I think that we I think she gave us tickets and we went and saw it before it came out we we might have because I I look I I wanted to see this movie for off. nine years and I have to say I mean I was. A lot of this movie was was to me not as good as the script. I don't I don't like right. when that happens, and I understand it's it's like, you know, you get working on these movies, you have to service many masters, and unless you're a a, a, a director that has already proven himself at this budget level, you have no power. You have to it's a, it's a battle you have to fight. But despite all that, watching it again with you, I like this movie. Yeah, I like it too. A lot of people don't like this movie. They, they hate this like movie. It, but a lot of people like it. A lot of people like it. I, I enjoy watching this film because I still get caught up in the plight of of poor Jim. Yes. You know, and, and, and knowing about space and understanding the predicament he finds himself in. You know. Yeah. It's Yeah. Well let's see let's see what other people have to say, because maybe you know, maybe people are uh Let's see uh, what uh, I'm gonna save dancing dogs tips for observations tomorrow. I okay. will get back to this. Zach Losel's here. Hello. L'chaim to Rob, Liz, and the PGS. It's been a rough week oh, or no. so. I'm embarrassed. I haven't gotten your package out. Apparently, you can't send alcohol, which means I had to rewrite my letter. Love. No, you don't have to. Oh. Well, oh, remember that's that so camera sweet, now. Sweet Zach. Thank you. I appreciate that, Zach. Uh, <clears throat> Here's well, Zach. I hope you're okay having a bad week. L'chaim to you, sir. I hope it gets better. Next week's must be better. Oh, uh, uh, John, Jim, I forget. John. <laughs> John. John says, hail Rob, hail Elizabeth. Cheers to you both. <laughs> cheers. Well, cheers to you too. Cheers. Yes. <laughs> uh, Picard Sucks sends in a super chat and says, hey Rob. I know this isn't Rob's observations, but what do you think of the new Tom Hanks movie going to Apple TV? I just downloaded the app and I can't wait. So the new Tom Hanks movie is about, it's a World War II film, which I'm in. Oh. It's about a convoy protecting, you know, trying to get across the Atlantic Ocean and the Nazis are after them. U-boats are after them. Count me in. I would watch that. Uh, anything to do with World War II with Nazis, I, I will watch. I will watch anything to do with World War II. But we don't have Apple TV. Not yet. We, we need to get it. But there's not enough on there yet. Yeah. I mean, all, when found How much is it? I don't know. But, yeah. You know, between everything. Foundation. I, I, I Look, I want to watch For All Mankind. I really want to watch The Morning Show. But there's like four shows. We'd be done with it in like... Yeah. I, I, yeah. But I, I really want to see that movie. So maybe that will be the thing that breaks... That'll break the camel's back. Is that Maybe. what you say? Uh, time heist thrust. Oh wait, hang on. Picard sucks. Goes on and says, "I loved Passengers so much. I bought the Blu-ray." Oh great, bra, dude! I rock that 4K, man. <laughs> I rock that 4K. Oh, it's buried in a box. It's buried we in a box. And I'm moving everything in here. Voodoo. Yeah, I know. Voodoo sucks, by the way. Not a fan <laughs> of getting in there. Not that bad. Yeah, but it, it's it's cumbersome. Yeah, the, the yes, it's kind of a pain because you have to order the movies on your computer and then you can watch them. I know I, I've packed up from P to Z of my my physical media collection because I'm moving it all, so it's all in boxes. Yeah, and uh, I it's it was the boxes are stacked quite high. And yeah, and you tried to find it. I did but... try and find. It. I'm like I just got. I was I like I can't. Yeah, I can't. Um, Time heist Throg sends in a, uh, a tip and says. I buy the time heist in Endgame. Can't stay awake during this movie. Oh. This and Batman and Robin. Total turd is Passengers. I don't think a movie could make me hate two actors more than Batman and Robin. This oh. movie succeeded <laughs> by a 14-foot anaconda. Hi, Claudius, says Throg. Oh. See, I again, uh, you know, I, I, I think... You Ma hate it that much that you hate now the actors? Come on. I think the actors acquit themselves admirably in this in this movie. I, I will say this, though. I, I think that the direction and the writing, the, the changes in the script, yes. you know, 
There's a, another movie, a New Zealand science fiction film that I dearly love called The Quiet Earth that uh, deals with a character waking up and everyone else in the world is gone but him. And I think they do a better job of watching a man go crazy because aside from growing a beard, yeah, there's nothing really insightful into what would a human being do yes and i i think yeah i, I agree think i don't think they went deep it, enough into that it, it just, also even when she wakes up there's not enough like of her freaking out like, yeah what I, the hell i think this really could have been a really interesting exam it's so superficial it is you know what 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 is when you're what is the existential what's it like when you're existentially alone when the cosmic void is is it's crushing you yeah. You know, I say the universe is indifferent, but what is it like to feel that? I mean, you're on a ship, like, wouldn't you do something really insane? Like, there's yes. no, there's no, you, you needed to see him go to the depths yep. of insanity, to the depths exactly. of... Exactly. Not and, just try to kill himself for one second. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think <clears throat> that's a real problem. If this movie had shown how far around the bend he had gone... Yes. And 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 but it's it's very superficial. It's it is very, very superficial. And it's it's unfortunately not nearly what it, it I think needed to be. Right. It was it was yeah. Yeah. But I don't think it's Throg, I don't think it's is it that bad? I I don't think it's that bad. Come on. Uh Claudius is here. Hello, Claude. Claudius says, Beautiful cinematography and art direction, the special effects including the space scenes look great. They do. Chris Pratt's character exemplifies the everyman and lover archetypes. I love J Law. Unfortunately, I do not think this movie has good verisimilitude. <laughs> well, you know what? It doesn't. I I think you're right about that. But the verisimilitude comes with the portrayal of uh -huh. the human characters. Yeah. I I think that the the style and the visual effects and everything are let down by how the script has been dumbed down it's been dumbed down for the for you know the the mall rat consumption yeah and and i i think yeah, they the, could have shown him like doing weird strange things that humans do when they are under duress yeah i mean i, I what would happen what does what does isolation do to a person yeah, like what i mean they never showed him like rocking in the corner or or just like doing or, strange yeah, I mean, things. They or... needed to show him go to the depths and that you hire a, a psychiatrist who is Absolutely. your technical advisor. But you know what? I'm sure the studio's like, well, nobody wants to see Chris Pratt go through that. They yes, don't want, actually, we, have to, we do. Yes, this movie. And then also when she wakes up, I, I felt like that was so... She just quickly got over it, and they they have this romance again. And again, that really bothered me. Again, it would have I been was like I wanted to see her really like. And, oh my God! I am, I am, I am. And it would have been changed to this fate. It would have been interesting that he's already been through this, and he could have gotten frustrated with her. Like he's watching her come to grips. She has to spend the same year he did. Yes. And the same depths of despair. Yes. That would have been a much more interesting Yeah, and it would have film. deepened their relationship even. D yeah, and that's how you you realize that she could fall in love with him because yep. he has to let her go. But and she quickly, after a few days, she's like, you know, and then well, I don't want to think about it is what she says. I don't want to think about it. Yeah, then they... I, I don't think so. I don't think a human would be like, I don't want to think about it. Again, again, because this is a studio movie and their desire to make this palatable for everybody, <laughs> they bled out. So I agree, the verisimilitude in this film is is has been let down, but not because the way it looks... It's the human element. Yeah. The human element is dis. It, you don't believe it. Plus, they, the, plus they took away all the. Like I was saying about the technology, it just some of it didn't make sense. Yeah, some of it absolutely. Claudius Claudius goes on and says, introducing a protagonist who commits an unforgivable crime is tough. Rob's favorite TV show, Discovery, does this with Michael Burnham, but in the military, there's no recovery from mutiny. Crimson Tide, no. I repeat. There is no return from mutiny. Uh, you know what, though? I don't know. There is no. He, Claude's in the Air Force. He would know. Yeah. But but in Crimson Tide, though, look, all of Crimson Tide is hogwash. I have friends who are submariners. It's hogwash. It is. I, I get that. But in the story that they're telling... 
It's not exactly mutiny. I mean, it's... Oh, it's, no, it, Crimson Tide, it was mutiny. No, I'm talking about this film. No, but but I mean, what what, what Claude is talking no, about I is know. a moral it's, act. It's unforgivable. It, it's an unforgivable moral act. I don't know, act. is it unforgivable? Well, I mean, I, I think mean, I think that's the real thing, is that we, a lot of people bump on that and they can't get any further. Right. Because the movie does not do enough it to doesn't. explain to you about the depths of... If you saw him go to the depths of despair... To levels of despair that we can't even fathom. You know, uh, uh, it doesn't do enough of that. So it doesn't. He just comes off as like, "How hard can it be, dude?" Right. You got and then your... she blows it off too. She's like, "I don't want to think about it." Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Um, but it's interesting. There, but in the military, yes, there's no return for mutiny. Claude's right. That's why I, I one more time. Any time that we can bash on mutiny, Star Trek though. Discovery. This is not mutiny. No, but what he's saying is it's a it's a morally indefensible act, just like mutiny. You can't you can't have a mutiny on a ship and then everyone's like, "Hey, man, you know what? It's cool because the chain of command is destroyed. But it's you not can the same never thing. you can never it's trust." It's not about a chain of of. No, but it's but, not, uh, but it's not the same thing. I know, but I I know I don't think Claude's saying it's mutiny. He's talking about there. It's a morally compromising act right. that you can never come back from. Well, I don't know. Well, that's, I mean, Not it's an exactly ethic. the same thing in my mind. Uh, Throg DMC says, I burned my overpriced 4K disc of this. After this film, it's time for some Python, maybe the Holy Grail. Hi, the Richard. I would rather sit through a 24 hour marathon of 90, the 92nd version of Freddy Got Fingered than Passengers. Oh, man. Wow. See, I, 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 wow. I, so See, much I hate for this. Uh, film. I know. I think there's. I there think are there's films that are a lot worse. There's more to like in this movie, I think, than that. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I guess. I guess you could hate it that much. I don't know. <laughs> uh, passenger Claudia says, "I think this movie asks all the wrong questions." Well, that I agree yes. with. Yes. I think the film should have focused on why the ship needed help to solve a problem. Yes. Pratt's decision to wake J Law is too distracting, and the justification is too convenient, and it does not exonerate him. That's interesting. But you know what, though? The script didn't either. And, and the question, I think that that's... I think if you were to do that, you know, you're missing the point of the cosmic void and loneliness. If you gave him a reason to awaken her, then there's no moral quandary at all. Like, he needed... He had to pick somebody to save those 5,000 people. Then there is no question... But you know, even so, I think they just didn't spend enough time dealing with that psychologically for either character. And I think if they had, oh. it would be a much... Oh, yeah, you took all the wine. Thank you. So, yeah, but I, I, I mean, I think, yes. I, I think that might be true, but then it would be too, too traditional and there would be no moral quandary about it. The problem is... They don't allow Chris Pratt to go to the depths of true despair. I mean, yeah. and, and the way they set it up, the way they do it. And I wouldn't blame the actors. I think it's a it's a script issue and a direction. Yeah, issue. I, I agree. I I absolutely agree. I agree. Yeah. But the problem is, you know, the problem is that wouldn't have been pleasant to watch. This movie is. They've made it palatable. They've made a reprehensible moral decision. Easy to swallow, even though it's not really. And if they had shown a guy like Chris Pratt wallow in the darkest, deepest, deepest pits of despair, the audience would have been turned off. They don't want to see Chris Pratt do that. Why not? There's plenty well, of films I, that show that. I agree. And if they had and done those are that, good films. Well, this then, but but is it a hundred hundred and twenty million dollar crowd pleaser? Oh come on, man. Well, I, I come on, man. I'm with you. I'm with you, but if you're you 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 know. No, I'm tired of like these these expensive films treating people like they're stupid. Come on, give us a little more depth. Look, here. I, look, but here's the thing: you give somebody a little what this movie should. You want to make that movie the way this movie should have been made is like Anara. Anara, you make it on a lower budget, 
where you're not spending $120 million. You make it for $35 million. Well, it definitely does deal more deeply with the psychological issues that you have when you are stuck in space for the rest of your life. Well, that's why if you guys have never seen Anara, Anaria, it's so bleak. Oh, I love it so much. <clears throat> you will want to kill yourself after you it's watch A-N-I-A-R-A. it. It's A N I A R A. It is a don't. Swedish film that's actually based on an epic poem. It's amazing. Oh my god, it's, it's so amazing. Awful. I, I love just, it. Oh. But it's low key. Oh my god. <laughs> it's low key. Um uh Croc and, uh, Crococonda Throg says, There is no AI in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Just laughs. British guys and coconuts. <laughs> please, please, I beg you, Viceroy, Seductress. What's up with writer B.L. Alley? What do you I mean? don't know. Is B.L. Alley here? What's he doing? I don't know. Is he hating on this movie? Yeah, he doesn't like this movie at all. <laughs> he might be hating on this movie. Yeah. Passenger Claudius sends in a tip and says, I agree. Uh, juxtapose the tone of Never Let Me Go with Passengers. Maybe Passengers should have felt more like 2001 and Never Let Me Go to understand the cosmic void and pathos. Look, I agree. The problem the problem with this film, and if you watch Inara, I, I say Inaria, it's A-N-I. Inari, I maybe it is Inara. I don't, know. That, that, I don't know. You keep recommending that film. That's just it. Go. It takes it too far. It's so. It's so bleak and it's so depressing. But and I it's find so it so overwhelming. The thought. I find it beautiful and, oh though. Oh my at the god! End. It's the, not beautiful at all. It's 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 oh, it's so it's too much. Too it? much. It's too oh. much. But this film could have used a little bit of that. <laughs> uh, well, yes. I mean, I think it. I, I because it doesn't. <laughs> writer bll he's like me <laughs> what are you doing dude <laughs> <laughs> i don't know man i mean bl alley and i are of, of the same mind on twitter lately yeah oh, yeah. bl has been writing some pretty uh well he's hilarious i loved his video i just laughed it was hilarious i cracked up the entire i video. told him you have not stopped saying that i know i love it um what is it when i say i have a better night he said have a buttered knife. <laughs> it was very funny. And the Captain Kangaroo thing, that was hilarious. Yeah, that's just great. Encourage him. <laughs> great. I love the Captain Kangaroo. <sighs> <sighs> no, I mean, but BL has been killing it on Twitter about this whole <laughs> book thing. It's been very interesting. Um, yeah, but I, I, I look, I think that this movie needed more... Uh, uh, of an erudite approach to the whole thing, but I still yeah, it just needed more depth. I, yeah, need, but I still <laughs> like watching it. Like you know what? Yeah, I don't hate this film. If I saw this movie when I was eight, and there will be eight-year-olds. I mean, sci-fi-minded eight-year-olds yes. that um, that that uh, see this. Yeah, I would have loved this movie. I would have thought yeah. this the profundity of this film. My eight-year-old mind would have said, "Mom." You don't understand. Is that what an eight-year-old sounds like? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> no. <sighs> no. So, where's your, uh, Chris Pratt figure? He's still in a box. Free the toys. Uh, that's, they're gonna, they're coming. They're Hashtag gonna be, free the toys. They're gonna be freed. <laughs> um, uh, Captain Space Throg sends in a tip and says, More to like... Very upsetting because it turned out terrible. I hardly think Pratt was miscast. Oh, I really think Pratt was miscast. No. Terribly miscast. Really? Could you picture it being Keanu Reeves? Well, hang on a Hell second. No. Hang on a second. I think Hell no. I think that I think that Space Throg uh, brings up a good point. And I will say this. When I when I was first at USC. Uh, my first day at USC, I was in the stately Doheny Library before I even knew there was a cinema library because I had never been this. I had gotten into the college and never been there before. And I read the script for Total Recall that David Cronenberg was going to direct. And he wanted Richard Dreyfus to play the lead. And in Total Recall, you find out that our everyman character is actually a secret agent. And the idea that. And the, the Verhoeven's Total Recall hadn't been made yet. It hadn't been made. So I knew that Total Recall, like this movie, had been developed over the course of years. 
And when I was reading the script, when you realize that he actually is a secret agent, maybe, and I was like, oh my God, it was a total shocking revelation. Yeah, yeah. And then when you see Verhoeven's movie and Arnold Schwarzenegger's there, when the revelation comes, well, of course he's a secret agent. Like, you're supposed to believe that Arnold Schwarzenegger is an everyman. And I know Verhoeven's over the top, so you go with it. But I always thought that, and in this case, Chris Pratt, because of how he became famous and what where he came up on, and I mean, he was in Moneyball. He was really good. What is it? Community. He was in right. Yeah, yeah. Community, yeah. and and he's this lovable goofball. You know, was married to Anna Faris. Now he's married to a Schwarzenegger, um, uh, it, Arnold's daughter. Uh, you know, I, I I don't think Throg is wrong. If you if you if you picked a more more not such a winsome cinematic idol. And more of an everyman, it might have worked a little better. Like who? Well, I don't know, but I'm just saying I, I, I get what he's saying. I mean, I get, I get where he's coming from about that. I, uh, hmm. I don't know. Well, listen, we're over our time. Again? We're over our time. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So, we're back to our front camera. So, Elizabeth... On our bottoms up scale, why do we have a bottoms up scale? Our bottoms up scale is from one to four glasses of wine because there are four glasses in a bottle. Four glasses in a bottle. Yes. Well, so on a scale of one to four glasses of wine, what do you give passengers? I'm going to give passengers a two point. 2.5 I too will give this movie two and a half glasses of wine two and a half glasses of wine two and a half glasses of wine uh, uh, Throg runs red oh boy. by the way uh, in case anyone might not have known <laughs> the film I produced The Hills Run Red is out on Blu-ray right now with six and a half hours of special <laughs> features which you can get and uh, even if you don't like the movie, because, you know, the movie's a low-budget slasher, uh, these special features alone I'm quite proud of, so check that out. But since Throg runs red, he says, I finally received my Blu-ray, and I'm awaiting patiently for the Arrow Academy 4K in 2030, or will that be 8K? There will never be, unfortunately, there will never be a 4K of The Hills Run Red. It will only ever exist in 2K. I know. What are you going to do? It's the way of the world. So we've given two and a half. I'm going to yes. tell you. I'm going to tell you what Monday's movie is going to be. Oh, you know. I know what Monday's well, movie is going to be. I know what ne next Friday's movie is going to be. So you first. I'm going to keep our science fiction theme going. Oh. Because I received the new Blu-ray of the remaster of what was my very favorite movie when I was five years old. Oh. The 1953 original, Byron Haskins, War of the Worlds. Very cool. War of the Worlds is our Monday movie, uh, and it is a movie where I knew science fiction meant business because, as I've said to people, it's a movie where the, the Martians fry a priest. The first person that dies in the movie was a priest, and when I was five years old... You were like, oh I my couldn't God. believe it. I knew somebody meant business. So. Okay. Mm. The Squish Show says they should have cast Steve Buscemi instead of Chris Pratt. That could have oh. been interesting. Um, you know, mm. obviously not as easy on the eyes for the ladies. Yeah, and then it would really, like, make you think. But, about... you know, what he could have really. Uh, yeah. The depths of despair. Yes. But I you know, see that. again, how do you spend 120 million dollars and put Steve Buscemi as a rapey romantic lead? I don't know. I mean, maybe you could. Yeah, why not? I I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I could picture um, that. <laughs> John says I've been enjoying some Aha Black Cherry coffee. Yes. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Aha, oh, I don't have it in front of me. Aha Sparkling Water. They make a black cherry coffee drink that with has caffeine. caffeine. It's so good. So, it's John, a nice what do you, pick me up? What do you think of? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong camera. What do you think of that? 
I hope you like it. It's delicious, first it's so, of all. It's so delicious. I love yeah. it. I mean, I love black cherry it's soda, nice but... after lunch to, like... Because, you know, you, you, you get sleepy after lunch. Yeah, it's perfect. It just gives you a little... Whoo, hello. So, uh, okay, tell so me about... you want to know what movie we're doing Friday. What movie are we doing for next Friday? For Romantic Friday. For Romantic Friday. I don't know. Well, next Friday is July 3rd. Okay. Okay. So, we had our first date on July 2nd. Ooh. Five years ago. Wow, July 2nd's our... F well, it's not really our anniversary. It's the anniversary of our first date. The anniversary wow. of our first date. Wow, okay, so okay. you know where I'm going with this. I know where you're going with this. So July 3rd, we are doing... Drum roll, please. Amelie. Amelie. <laughs> the movie that the movie solidified that our... The movie that brought us together. Amelie. Five years being together five years being together or five years for our we first date we are doing Amelie on wow. the 3rd of July so there you go good choice I, I toast to you love <laughs> I toast to you Amelie Amelie um Picard sucks sending a super chat with a <laughs> with, with a, a rainbow, uh, with a uh, rainbow with a, a unicorn a, a unicorn is that a Blade Runner reference well ladies and gentlemen that brings an end to whining about movies episode number 45 passengers yes and uh so we got war of the worlds the yes. original 1953 war of the worlds on monday uh my brand new blu-ray i got from australia i know that criterion's putting out a blu-ray that comes out next week and i will own that too what i know right i know come on man on. Come on, man. I still got my laser disc of War of the Worlds. What's up? Yeah, yeah. I don't see the point of your laser discs. Uh, does anyone want to buy some laser discs? No. The, and no. a laser disc player? No. Two. Two no. laser disc players. No. Don't be don't be selling my... No. What are you going to do with those laser discs? They're going to all be in the Rob Observatory. Doing what? Rocking. You're not going to ever watch them. I am going to. I'm going to set it up, man. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Come on, man. Like, why would you watch that? That's like watching a VHS tape. It is, but it's kind of cool. Anyway. Nonsense. So, anyway, what do we say at the end of a show? Yes, everyone you meet has a story to tell that you yet have to hear. You have yet to hear. <laughs> All you have to do is listen. All you have to do is listen. Uh, I want to thank everybody that makes this channel possible. I want to thank uh, the Richard for being here, being a moderator. He's he's had to do a lot of work this week, so thanks the Richard uh, for being a moderator. But I also want to thank him for putting on. If you haven't gone to the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page, or you haven't gone to the Whining About Movies Facebook page, please visit them. Look up the Richard, find him because he is constantly running watch parties. Like the guy stays up all night. He shows obscure gems. He has themed movie nights check it out live watch parties all the time on facebook and uh it's amazing just real quick captain is painless you put an s on the end of hoarders i'm not a hoarder i'm not a hoarder i only have very specific stuff so anyway check that out so thanks to richard thanks mike bodden thanks jordy lyons thanks greg smith Thanks, Haynock. I hope one day that um, Detective Jim Boyers comes back. I miss Jim. Why don't you just ask him? I should. I should. We need Jim back. Get him Let, back. I'll call him tomorrow. It's Sunday. I'll pray. Um, <laughs> so, and then what do we say? Have a better night. Have a better night, everyone. Thank you for spending your Saturday nights with us, or Saturday days, or in the middle of the night, wherever you are. War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds. 7 o'clock. Monday night, Byron Haskins, 1953 masterpiece, my first favorite movie in my life, and uh, I can't wait to watch, actually I haven't even put in the new Blu-ray, the first time it's been on Blu-ray in HD, Criterion's releasing a Blu-ray next week, it's all good, so, good night. Good night.